Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Hype with Black Enterprise. I'm your host, Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior VP, Executive Editor at Large at Black Enterprise. This edition of Beyond the Hype is brought to you by J.P. Morgan Chase. Man, do I have a great guest for you today. Let me start with Super Bowl 56. It's the first halftime show that has an all hip hop lineup. Uh, you would think that maybe it should have happened a long time ago, but it's mm -hmm. happening now. And my guest on today's show, it's arguable that that never would have happened if it wasn't for what he did 40 years ago. And it's hard to believe it's been 40 years. Please welcome to the show, the creator of Video Music Box, Ralph McDaniels. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was awesome. And I didn't even think about that till you said, you know, that should, that Super Bowl is coming up and it's so many hip hop artists and Mary J. Blige and all of those artists are guys that I knew when they were 19, 20 years old. Right. <laughs> well, Video Music Box, um, it means has a, a personal meaning for me because 1983 was like my first year as a New Yorker. I had just got out of Rutgers College, Rutgers University in New Jersey. Started my career in Brooklyn at Big Red News in Brooklyn as an right. editor there. And I was a brand new New Yorker. And when Video Music Box hit the scene, man, uh, you, know, you, you see, the, 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 I don't want to say the kids, but people today may not remember what it was like back then when you couldn't get radio airplay for hip hop. Nobody, nobody took it seriously. People didn't really want to give it shine. So talk to me, I mean, we'll get deeper into the other things you've done since then, about you deciding that video music box is an idea that needed to happen and really setting, you, you become one of the foundational pillars of what makes hip hop an international phenomenon today. Yeah, you know, um, in the early eighties, we didn't have a lot of uh, African-American folks on the screen or writing magazines. You know, you mentioned Big Red and I forgot about Big Red. I was like, whoa, Big Red, you know, but if, once you got to the newsstand, if Big Red ran out, that was it. You couldn't see it. There was no more, you know, like, you got any more Big Red? Nope, sold out. You know, you had to wait till the, you know, the next one. And so this is the way media was put out back then. And I mean, not just for African-Americans, just for everybody. That was just the way technology was at the time or non-technology. And so um, I was working I'm in college. I was working at the TV, uh, the radio station. And I remember I wanted to do a radio show. You know, I wanted to play music that I was into. Some of it was hip hop. Some of it was reggae. Some of it was R&B records. And they were like, nope, can't do that. All we do is rock and roll. Nothing else. No, no, no other kind of music. <laughs> Which was pretty strange. You know, you sit there and you go like, wow. You know, like you were just blocking like 24 hours of programming. We can't have not one little moment for hip hop or reggae or R&B. But that just wasn't happening on rock and roll stations. That was also happening on WBLS and WWRL. They were like, nope, can't bring that hip hop over here. Nope, this is just a trend. It's not happening. You know, some of the big names that I looked up to shut me down. You know, like, nah, Ralph, that's not gonna happen. And so um, I was like, man, we have to create something on our own. And I was working at this low power, nobody's paying it, no mind, TV station, um, WNYC. And I went there and I got an internship and then they hired me after I graduated. And one day I was looking at the channel. I was like, maybe you can do it here. We could do something on TV, but it would be like radio on TV. So you wouldn't necessarily see me. You'd hear my voice and I'd be playing videos. And videos had just started, just came out. And we started doing it. And by word of mouth, everybody started getting on to it. Everybody started going like, hey, what's this? Because we didn't have anything, you know? It's like in my documentary that's on Showtime right now, Nas says, we just needed just 10 minutes, 10 seconds of anything that was hip hop and we would have been happy. That's all we, if we saw Rock Him or Eric B or, you know, or, or Run DMC, we would have been, oh man, we saw him for 10 seconds. We were, we were happy. That's how we wanted this stuff. And so we created this program. Um, I just started doing it with whatever I had, whatever cameras I could get together, whatever friends I could get together. I, I based everything on, um, cause I never hosted a show. I never done anything like that. I based what I saw um, early journalists on TV on the news did. So they were like, you know, man on the street, um, John Johnson, 
or you know whoever it was. Right, you know, right. I did what they did, <laughs> and and that's how the, the TV show started. You know, Ralph, you mentioned the doc that was on um, Showtime. It came out last year, twenty twenty one. Yeah, and you, you're talking about going from if we could just get ten seconds, we'd be happy. How satisfying, or what was the experience like for you to have this whole documentary? on Video Music Box, the impact of Video Music Box. We're not talking now 10 seconds of something, on, but on a public television station. Now you're talking about a major uh, movie platform saying this is worthy of telling this story. And the name of the doc, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, is you're watching Video Music Box. Talk to me about that experience, man. Oh, man, it was overwhelming, you know, to have, you know, like at first, you know, it's a little nervous because you want to make sure that you get your story right. Because very easily when you go to Hollywood, the narrative can be changed because Hollywood wants it to feel a certain way. And you know, the network has this type of look or the network tells stories like this. So they can change your story to work for them. And I was like, you know, okay, we're not gonna let that happen. I worked too hard. I've held out for so long and being independent that I'm not gonna allow this to happen to me because if it, you know, there's so many people behind me that look up to me. There's so many of my peers that have said, this is not gonna happen to me. I can't let this happen to me. So the pressure of that was to not let it happen. And so I fought for everything that's on that screen. You know, I fought for, you know, certain things that, you know, I felt was mandatory. This has to be there. You know, we have to show the community minded stuff that we did with Video Music Box to show why the show still to this day means so much to the community. Like what we were doing in, um, in Rikers Island or, what we were doing to get kids to get out there and vote or how we were helping, you know, artists that, you know, they didn't have a lot of um, support or marketing or whatever they call it now, but we gave them a shot. And that little shot was enough to propel them into having some success and then being able to get marketing dollars and people behind them. So, you know, um, I wanted to tell the story of the, you know, the, the, the unknown people that you don't know about, you know, that were are still part of hip hop the pioneers, they didn't have a record out. They weren't on the radio. They didn't work at, you know, some big media company. But these were the people that kind of set the blueprint for where hip hop is today. And they didn't get the notoriety. And, you know, and I wanted to tell part of their story in in, in that. And, 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 you know, and sometimes that could be a fight because people want the, the star, star value. That's what hip hop Hollywood wants. They want star value. Okay, where's the stars? Who you got for us, Ralph? And, you know, I got that too. You know, and I called up folks that I hadn't spoken to in a while, but I know that I played a big impact. And they expressed to me years ago that I played a big impact on their career. And one of them was Jay-Z and one of them was was uh, uh, Diddy and um, and Mike Tyson. He used to come to our parties in Brooklyn. And um, and then um, Nas came on. Nas was executive producer at first. And then Nas said, you know what? This is different. I want to get this right, Ralph. And um, I want to direct it. And so I was like, have you ever directed this? This is my first time. So I was like, okay. I mean, that it didn't matter to me that it was his first time because he's seen enough and been around enough things over the last 30 years of his career that he knows how to do this. It's just that I was concerned that he have enough time to do it. Right. So, um, so yeah, so now I said, yeah, I'm going to make the time. I'm going to do this. And, and at that point, my whole body felt different because I knew that he was a person that cared about the culture. And I knew that I had somebody push come to shove that was in my corner that I could call say, yo, look, man, I really, really need this, man. And he would have took care of me. And, um, and then from that on, from that point on, um, it was a great feeling. It was overwhelming. You know, once, once you finish, it's like, you know, I guess writing a book or, you know, any kind of project that you're working on over a period of time and you're finished and you're okay, that's it. We're taking that out of your hands and it's going to to the public. And, you know, that's a scary feeling like, wait, 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 I have a couple more things I want to change. And then you're like, that's it. And that time from them taking it out of our hands to the day that it aired, December 3rd, was overwhelming because I knew we did a great job. You know, I knew we, I, I said, I know this is a great doc. And when it came out and Showtime said, this is our number one streaming doc right now, documentary. And I was just, you know, tears came to my eye because I said, man, we did it. Yeah. We did it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the things that you said, you know, 
Nas had never directed before. You weren't you weren't a journalist when you started. You and and so much of of of, of this amazingness of hip hop is an entrepreneurial industry and venue for Black people, especially back yeah. in the day. Um, and, and this is Black enterprise, and of course we've covered hip hop as an industry and as a business over the years with everybody from D to Jay Z on the cover over the years. But I, I want you to emphasize this whole idea or tell it from your point of view of what it means for part of hip hop culture to be, no, I never did this before. Right. No, I never started a clothing company before. If you talk about Damon John and his partners at FUBU. No, right. I never, you know, put together an act and put together a show before. No, I never did a TV show before. And how a big elemental part of hip hop is like, we want to do this and we may do this in a way that nobody ever thought of doing it. We don't really know what we're doing wrong because right. we were trained to do this, but we're doing it because it has to be done. Talk to me about that. You could have, you had a lot of reasons to be discouraged at the beginning when, like you said, people were telling me this is not a real thing and this is not a fad and we're not going to give it any time. And, and who are you anyway? You're, you're your former intern. Talk right. about, the, but the mindset you had to have, which I think is an important um, aspect of the entrepreneurial mindset, no matter what you think you're trying to do, to say, yeah, but like you didn't let the di idea die when you got to to nah. YC. You was like, oh, wait, this might be the place I can get it done. Yeah, no, you know what? I think over the years, I watched um, white folks do stuff and they fail. And they might try, you know, and, and corporations put all this money into it and it failed. And those people didn't get fired. They just was like, okay, we'll try it again. We'll do something right. else next month. And then a black uh, African-American comes in and is in, and it's sometimes it's mental. It's, and with me, it was mental. I put all this pressure on myself. Like I gotta, you know, cause if I don't get this right, I'll never get a shot again, you know? And, and you know, and that's the old way of thinking. I don't think that young people think like that anymore. They shouldn't, they shouldn't think like that at all. White folks blow money all day all, and then it's no problem until they get it right. So don't think if you could blow, run through the money until you get it right. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Yeah. And so if you can, if you're using their money, if it's your money, then it's a different story. We'll talk about that too. <laughs> and so, you know, and so once I realized that, I said, okay, it's no problem. We're gonna, we're gonna do what we have to do. We're gonna have the best at what we need. We're gonna do everything at, at this level. And I remember having a conversation about in the contract before I even got started. In the contract, it said, um, uh, okay, who are the executive producers? And I said, I have to get the executive producer credit. So you know, only two people can get that in the first, in the beginning. And, you know, they was like, well, you know, Ralph, the whole thing is about, the whole documentary is about you. Why do you want executive producer credit? Why does your logo have to be on there? I said, because it's business. Business. It's forget about me, video music box, and all this cool stuff that we're doing in the documentary. But that title at the beginning of the documentary, right behind the Showtime logo, and all of that stuff is for business purposes, is super important. And we have to encourage and let people know that that's something that we need to have. We just don't want to be the players on the field. And that, that wanna... is such a foundational <laughs> part of hip hop culture because it was the first musical venue and not just the first black musical venue really the first musical venue that was like we about this money we're about this business we're not apologizing for it yes we're artists yet but we we're building this from the ground up none of y'all want to invest in this in the beginning so we invested in ourselves and and there's still this you know i don't think it's a coincidence that that you see what you know whether it's jay-z or 50 cents or master p you know, who are now, now being recognized as much as entrepreneurial successes as they were as artists, because that idea of, no, this is, yeah, that's, that's art. That's, this is creative. I'm glad you enjoy it, but who's getting credit and who's getting paid without apology? Yeah. No, I mean, we're in the middle of Black History Month, right? was well, Black History Month now. And, um, and these are the things that we fought for, you know, that somebody fought for before me, you know, the the you know Evan Johnson and Johnson publications and all of these things and so they did it already for me now it's not it's not I'm not supposed to drop the ball and just let these things go you know and then all of a sudden sign up with you know whoever company 
if you can, and not everybody can run their own company. You know, this, some you have to do that. No, so not everybody wants to run their own company and have all those responsibilities. I understand that. But once you take that money as an independent person and you put it in somebody else's hand, those people are not going to spend money with the black community because they don't know the black community. And I took pride in everything that I do is like, we have to hire a certain amount of black folks. You know, I'd be that guy on the set, you know, like, um, were any, you know, lighting people that were available that were black, you know, I'm bringing up those type of questions, you know, for years from, from when I first started. And even now, you know, I'd be like, mm -hmm. A couple of brothers, need a couple of brothers around, a couple more brothers and sisters around, you know, <laughs> and they'd be looking at me like, oh, here go Ralph. But, you know, because if you don't bring it up, nobody else will. Right. You know, you know, it, traditionally, I'm not saying that things haven't changed in that place. No, but it's changed because more and more people are bringing it up. I mean, that's that's really the, the legacy of black enterprises. Like somebody in the room, uh, our, our, our late founder, Earl Gray, used to say they didn't put you in the room because they ran out of smart white people. You, right. you need to be there to speak up because you're right. If no one, if you don't speak up, nobody will to at least raise the idea and have the discussion so that, um, you know, things can change. And, and speaking of that, you, you talked about, um, you know, creating opportunities to get brothers and sisters to do things that maybe they didn't have opportunity to do. You pioneered so many things off of Video um, Music Box. And one of the other things that you pioneered along with, um, I believe, your childhood friend Lionel uh, Martin, um, was you launched a, a video production company. Now, this, again, way back in the day, uh, and, and your know, classic concert productions, I mean, you did, I mean, when I drop these names now, people are gonna be like, oh my God, but back in the day, I mean, you had Biggie, you had Big Daddy Kane, you had SWV, you had, Udine, like you were doing the people who are now the icons of, of the genre, but back in the day, getting a music video, you know, in the, in the like you said, in the 80s, um, produced and then produced authentically, um, you, you created a, a business and pioneered something we take for granted now, which is that music in general and hip hop in, in particular has hot music videos. Yeah. Um, Lionel and I, once again, knew nothing about making music videos, <laughs> but we watched them all the time on the TV show, you know, on Video Music Box. And we were like, huh, I think that video could have been better. Well, why didn't they shoot it in this location? Because they're talking about Harlem, but I don't know where they're at in this location. It looks like some Hollywood set. You know, that don't look like Harlem. And so, you know, how do we do this so we can make it authentic? You know, a little bit more, you know, real to what, you know, because I loved watching music videos. I was a fan of music videos. And and we we worked on it. We found some guys that knew how to shoot film and we hired as many um um, brothers and sisters that we knew that were around us who weren't getting jobs on some of the, the more bigger jobs because they were black and they were just as qualified. So we were getting super qualified people to come work with us that had been doing this way before us. And they taught us how to, how it worked. And, um, and then, you know, Lionel was super creative, one of the best directors I've known in the planet. And he was just coming up with these incredible ideas and, you know, I remember the first couple of Big Daddy Kane you mentioned and Biz Marquis, rest in peace to him. And all of these the self-destruction, we did that video, was amazing still Man, to this day. That's, that's still amazing to this day. It's still jaw-droppingly amazing. Yes. Not only the message, but who was in it and taking all those different styles because every one of those rappers had a very distinct style, but yeah. you're still able to blend it together in a way that made sense, but it was still authentic. Nobody looked watered down or tossed in just for the sake of appearance i mean don't get me started because that's the every time i see that you know, i'm like <laughs> oh man just just a no, masterpiece. It's a but masterpiece. that was the magic that was the magic of lionel you know he had you know he, he he when he heard the song he was like got it you know and you know and we're going to do it in these schomburg uh, library in harlem and some of it is going to be in you know on the streets and some will be in in the prisons you know we we, we had an idea of the environment that we all live in. We all live in different spaces. Some of us live in the same spaces or at once, you know? Right. <laughs> and so we, we, we understood what that would be. And so, yeah, so we didn't know anything about it. We got started and then we became the go-to people for creating, you know, some cool music videos. We've done over 400 music videos. Um, and the other thing too is, 
you know, all of this content that I had been shooting from 83. So I was going out and shooting all of this stuff. And, you know, like, you know, when you do a story for television or for a film or whatever it is, you usually only use like a tenth of what you shot. (laughs) And so there's all of this content that we've created over the last 38 years, which has been crazy because now I'm starting to go back and look at some of the other things that were there that I didn't use. And that's, we, we created this uh, thing called the Video Music Box Collection. And it's a nonprofit organization that just is, we're digitizing and we're, we're using it for educational purposes. We wanna be able to make it available. I mean, we are making it available to, to, to institutions and libraries, uh, learning institutions, libraries, museums. You know, uh, I'm in the Schomburg, but I've never done a program at the Schomburg. I mean, um, I've never done a, um, not the Schomburg, the, the um, uh, one in DC. Which one? Library of Congress. Library of Congress. Yeah. I'm in there, but I've never done a program there. So we need to do more programs about hip hop in those spaces. And that just opens the door, all of this incredible content that you'd be surprised. It's not just black folks come to see, it's the hipsters that want to know like what really happened at that particular time. So, yeah. Now, you, you, just, just, but you just said it's not just black people or not just hip hoppers, it's not just urban people. I, I'm going to say this, um, and, and this is my opinion, so don't, you know, don't, I didn't get this to somebody else, and, but here's my opinion. When you talk about the ripple effects of hip hop video in particular, and you mentioned it earlier, before that, vi- music videos in general were like Hollywood productions. The idea of authentic places and actually being in Harlem or being in Brooklyn or being in, in, in uh, uh, you know, where, wherever, you know, uh, in, in South Side Chicago or whatever, being the actual set where the videos take a place, where the people are from, where it was actually happening was not a thing in music videos or in Hollywood in general. And I tell people now, you, we take for granted now, 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, the impact of that on shows like Law and Order, which right. was like, the, the, you know, because, you know, if you're a New Yorker and you watch the typical cop show that was supposedly set in New York, and you was looking at like, <laughs> like you said, that ain't New York. Right. That, you could tell that's a Hollywood set. They put in some cabs from New York to try to make it look like New York or some cop cars <laughs> from New York. But like that ain't New York. But, but the, you know, the magic of, of the franchise Law and Order, which still won't die, not that anybody's right. trying to kill it, but, you know, SVU and now, you know, organized crime was that if you lived in New York, you could walk up on a set of Law and Order being where they're shooting a scene because they're actually doing it in New York. And I think that impact everything from film and Hollywood, you know, when you see shows like, you know, you know, uh, you know, NCIS, New Orleans or whatever. Those, and the idea is that there's the Hollywood version. And then there's us trying to capture the authenticity to add to the veracity of the story. And I, I personally, again, this is nobody else. This may be just my opinion. I credit that to the work that you and others have done in terms of if we, if we wanted to do a story, a, a song that's about life in Brooklyn or life in Houston or whatever, we're going to do it on the streets of Brooklyn or Houston or Atlanta or whatever. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that once I started doing it in New York, then I started working with well, myself and Lana started working with other artists in other cities, Detroit, um, Atlanta, um, L.A., you know, and I, what it made me do was go to these cities, learn about local life in these particular cities, because everybody's every city is different, has its own, you know, DNA. And you sit down and you look and you feel and you talk with people and you hang out with people and people credit me for playing music from other areas in New York that traditionally wouldn't have been played in New York because I went to these cities, met people, you know, I went to LA, you know, I, 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 I saw what Dre and Ice Cube and, and those dudes were doing out there and Ice-T and others. And I went to Miami, I learned, met Luke, you know, and even though he was making Miami bass music, which is a big thing in the, in the South and Miami, you know, I didn't understand, you know, why. But when you go to Miami, everybody's wearing a bathing suit and they jump around dancing right, right. because it's hot. You know? and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, I was like, okay. So we brought that back to New York. And, you know, 
and people like I never saw any of this stuff, even, you know, Caribbean music, you know, like, you know, Fat Joe <laughs> says in the documentary that I ain't even never met a Jamaican before. And Ralph was playing this music. <laughs> and I was like, you knew who Jamaicans were. Cut it out. They were Jamaicans in the Bronx. He said, but I never really saw them talking. I wasn't talking to them. <laughs> so, but, you know, that was the power of the media and 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 what um, what we do, because, you know, I also met people that were really good writers. And, you know, and you talk about, you know, people say theater of the mind, Ralph, theater of the mind. And you can make these words, you can paint a picture with these words. And, you know, and I, you know, I work around people that are some of the best in the world, especially rappers, you know, like I didn't know it at the time that Biggie was an incredible writer. You know, the paint, the picture that he painted, you like, what planet did this kid come from that he saw all of this? You know, because I walked down the same block and I didn't see none of that. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> you know, um, the, the other thing that I, that I, that I give, uh, you, you know, Video Music Box credit for as a foundational um, uh, platform for media communication and content is that, and I'm going to build this bridge again, now we take for granted seeing Ice T on, you know, SVU, um, you know, LL Cool J on TV, uh, Queen La with a TV series, Queen Latifah, um, and certainly the crossover into movies with hip hop artists ranging from Will Smith to Most Def. But again, back in the 80s and 90s, you only saw hip hop stars on screen and maybe their first time ever being on a movie set or a film set was when they were shooting the video, and of course, you got to do more than sing the song. You got to live the, you know, the, or portray the life of the character, whether it's a real character or just a metaphor for a story being sold in the song. So, you know, I was telling people if you look back in the day and you look at the work that Video Music Box did and, 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 and others that followed, followed in your footsteps, you were really kind of a, a, both a talent finder and a training ground for young people, you know, teenagers you know, in the early 20s who could flow, but they didn't know anything about acting and cues and hitting a mark and playing to a camera. And it was like a foundational acting school. So I say, nope, you shouldn't be surprised that now, of course, you know, you think, yeah, that star is hot. They're gonna go into acting in the film. Yeah. Talk about that. Did you did you see any of that early on? Or that was just, that just came was a, a byproduct of the, of the work that you guys were doing? It's funny because I worked uh, with Tupac um, on Juice. That was the first film I ever did in 1992. And Tupac was the only person, the production was all shot in New York and uh, directed by Ernest Dickerson, who worked with Spike on a number of films as a DP, but this was his first directing job. And Tupac came in and they said, we got this guy, Tupac. Now I really didn't really know who Tupac was because he's not Tupac yet. He was part of Digital Underground and he was introduced there, but you know, some of the music people knew him. And so they were, oh yeah, that's my man. He's down with Digital Underground. So I'm like, all right, cool. So he was, first of all, he went to acting school. So he's a little different than others. Um, he was a, you know, a arts and culture major. And um, so he had an idea of what was going on. And so, and he had done some music videos and he took all of that and he took all of whatever he was watching other artists do prior to him in the 80s, the Big Daddy Canes, the Will Smiths, the whoever, X-Clans, the uh, Digital Underground, quite obviously a big influence on because he's part of that group. And he brought all of that energy into Juice. Never did a film before. Mm. Never did a film. Never acted. He's the, he's the principal in a major film, a major motion picture. And he stepped on there like he was Wesley Snipes, like he had been doing this for years. Mm. And he was very focused. I remember him getting into arguments with some of the other guys, the other principals like Omar Epps, because Omar was having fun. And Omar also lived in New York. Most of the other guys all lived in New York. Khalil, his dad was one of the last poets. Um, I can't remember Chubby Kid's name. He's, he's the only one that had some experience because he was in Lean On Me. And and Tupac came in and was like, look, I came, 
I stopped my whole life to do this. You know, I stopped recording. I stopped being on tour with, with Digital Underground. And I came here to New York and I'm going to do this thing. I put my life on it and I'm, I'm betting on, you know, that this is going to work for me. And so I'm not going to sit here and joke around. I'm not playing. When we finish, we can go have a good time. But during the time when we supposed to be shooting, he says, I'm serious. And they were getting the serious arguments. You know, if he felt like you weren't taking the scene seriously. And um, and so I watched that experience. He knew he had a once in a lifetime chance right now. And he probably wasn't. He was talented. He was going, he was going to be all right. But in his mind, it was his once in a lifetime. Well, part and, of what makes Tupac good and what makes our champions and, and, and almost any of it ever good is that they treat it like this is the shot. Even yeah. if it ain't the last shot, but they treat yeah. it like it's the last shot. Yeah. And so I watched that, what you just talked about, him bring whatever we had, whatever we had, you know, and bring that experience to the screen. And, you know, the film is, you know, a classic hip hop. No, it didn't it's just a great story. You know, and and Tupac filled that 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 void in that 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 role to really bring it out, and that was then the beginning of him doing all kinds of incredible stuff. So, Ralph, now we're talking now again. It's, it's, when I say these words, it's hard for me to believe, but we're talking nearly four decades later. Um, <laughs> and in the time we got left, I want to get your take um, on the state of hip hop and the impact hip hop today and where you see it going and, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, good, bad, or indifferent. I don't, my thing is that it's a, but the cool thing about hip hop, it's, it's, it's mature now, but it's still fresh. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it, it, it's not this brand new faddish thing that people thought it was in the early eighties. Um, so it's, it's established. You can't be around for 40 years as a genre and have the impact it has and act like it's something fresh and new. But at the same time, it is seems to be reinventing itself over and over and over again, um, internationally, different parts of the country. Talk to me about as someone who's been cultivating and sharing in the evolution of hip hop culture um, for the last four decades. What do you see now, and, and where do you see it headed, and, and what do you what do you think the consequences or the opportunities are going forward? I think we're in a great space right now um, for young people that are making music. Um, I think that it's right where it should be. You know, everything evolves. And, you know, what I've learned at some point was that I didn't understand what the heck was going on in hip hop. And because it wasn't for me, it was for a, a new generation of kids that were coming up that talked in their own language. And and I was like, well, I, it feels like the same energy. And a friend of mine said, you have to go to a concert where they have one of these groups performing. Like, you know, not no big, don't have to be a big artist. Could be just somebody mid range that's, you know, popular. And I went and I sat there and I felt the same energy that I felt when I was going to concerts, when I was young, I thought that they were feeling the same energy. And I said, okay, so it's the same thing, it's just, transformed in a different way. Um, what I did learn was, and it's probably because of technology, is that the, you, the new hip hop artists abbreviated everything. So in other words, we used to use a whole paragraph to say something, they say it in four words, four, 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 four sentences. Or yeah, for, 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 I don't know if they're sentences, but <laughs> whatever they are. The phraseology, is so, um, I guess I'm looking for the word tight, right? Um, that they can get very complex ideas across, like you said, in, in only a few words. They can they can get yeah. that picture in your head in only a few words. And my recollection back in the day, and I always tell my kids, one of, one of my um, children is a hip hop artist. Um, I've become uh, kind of, you know, friends slash I call him big brother to like Taylor Bennett, um, Chance's younger brother in Chicago. So now I'm spending more time with guys that like in their 20s, you know, you know, early 20s to early 30s or whatever. And I tell people, if you say hip hop generation, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, there's yeah, like yeah. five hip hop generations. <laughs> you don't, you're not talking to the right one. You won't understand what they're saying. But yeah. back in the day, in my from my recollection, you could tell me if you remember different. 
you were impressive by how many words you could say to tell the story. And, you know, it was how many words you could throw out. Right. <laughs> and, right. and now yeah. it's almost now, like you said, it's almost more minimalist. How yeah. big a picture can you paint? But almost don't talk at all in some cases, just yeah. gesture. And, and the kids get it like right away. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, it's 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 um, and I, I mean, technology made us do that. You know, you know, it just happened. You know, when we started tweeting and texting and things like that, that's when all of that started. And you remember that was almost 20, maybe more than that, 20 years ago when we all of a sudden started being abbreviating everything, you know, and, you know, so, oh, and, and there's a symbol to go along with. So we didn't have to say the word anymore, you know, and so they just took all of that and that becomes their language in 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 hip hop or in any genre of music and they use it and and that's that's the way it goes so if you understand that you know you might not understand some of the references they have because it might not be a reference that you're familiar with you know you know they may reference something that's whatever some new clothing brand that just came out last year and we don't know anything about that so you know so whatever the case is you know i respect that evolved it's that's just it, it evolving and you know and there are some great artists out there you know probably you know drake is probably the greatest of this particular era you know and just consistently hit after hit after hit after hit and kind of like we understand drake you know you know we the older crowd can oh yeah we love drake so he crosses over into a bunch of different areas outside of the the traditional crowd that may be buying and supporting this particular young music but um, yeah, I think that it's in a fine place. Um, technology is going in a different place. You know, we talk about Web3, we talk about the, the metaverse, we talk about crypto people, you know, yeah, that's NFTs, their world. NFTs, yeah, NFTs, yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're in that space now, you know, where, you know, I'm going back and forth and kicking it with folks that I know that love hip hop, and I love what they're doing in that space, in the crypto and NFT world. And we're just, just all creative people in a sense. Um, and, and, and whatever comes out of it, comes out of it. You know, you don't want to force it. Right. You know, right. you, you, you want to make it, make it, you know, I mean, we're, we're authentic at what we do, but we want to create something that is, is, is authentic to the space. You know, that's one of the things that gets me excited, Ralph, is that if we, if we, as we've already said, if the original quote unquote first hip hop generation was entrepreneurial, when I see the things that, you know, Chance Bennett is doing, Taylor Bennett is doing, um, you know, I, I'll mention my son by name so I won't get in trouble, but E. Nigma is doing, they're actually more impressive to me as business people. Yeah. But, you know, as, as, as talented as they are as artists in terms of their merchandising and having a real merchandising strategy, um, you know, uh, you're again, yeah, selling music, getting into NFTs, understanding the importance of NFTs to the ability to build value and wealth into their brand. It, it's, it's like, they're really like entre little entrepreneurs on steroids. Um, and I don't mean little as in small, but little as in young compared to now what we consider the quote unquote the OGs. Um, who are obviously at the top of the wealth creation game when you think of people like Kanye and Jay-Z and Nas and, 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 and those people. Talk to me about the, the, the evolution of hip hop as a business and as of hip hop artists as business people. And I, I'm just thinking of even the, the excellent branding when you talk about the Wu-Tang W or Chances 3, like you talk about j just in ways that we didn't think about in the in the in the eighties when hip hop was coming out and it was evolving, now there's some real intentionality yeah. of, of doing what you said. This is a business, and I, you know, I need to protect my brand. I need to protect my stake because this is a business that obviously everyone else will make money off of. But I, I need to make sure I own and control my piece of that pie. You, you it reminds me of a, a conversation, well, a, a statement that um, Diddy made in my doc. He said in the nineties we realized our worth because up to that point, we didn't know what our value was in comparison to other things. And it wasn't until you went into the venue and you sold it out and you saw 15,000 people, or if you saw a thousand people, whatever it was, 
that you were like, oh, people really like me. And so I'm worth something, you know, like up to that point, it was like, I'm being creative and I'm doing all this cool stuff. And I know my friends like it and a couple of people over here like it. Now you you understand your worth. So what do how, what is that worth like? N- n- nobody signed it. Well, no, I shouldn't say nobody. Most people are not signing record deals anymore because they can do everything right here in this space. So that means I have 100 percent of me. You know, I own it. You know, I own my brand. I own my merch. I own my music and I can do it now. If I decide to give up something for whatever reason, a percentage of something, that's a lot because I, I, you know, like, what am I getting for that? Right. In the beginning, in the 90s, or forget about the 90s, in the 70s, when people like James Brown and Earth, Wind and Fire and Sly and Family Stone would sign these contracts, they were getting pennies. Yeah, because they were sold that they were happy because, and we've seen all the movies, The Temptations, The Five Heartbeats, whatever. You were happy that you got a car, fly car to drive, even though you didn't know you was paying for it. You had your face on the album cover and crowd screaming, and you were like, I made it. I made it. Let me buy my mama's house. Right. You're right. And and this what, by the way, we should make it point out, this wasn't just with Black artists. This was with all artists. You know, like you said, they didn't know their value. They were getting fame, and they were getting a lot of attention, and they didn't understand their own value, you know, and and the importance of of ownership. And now, again, you got people like... uh, Attorney Ben Trump helping people like George Clinton get the rights to their own catalog back. And in some cases, right. the rights to their own name. MC Light just got the back to rights. Yes. MC Light back. So you're right. right. There's the, the current generation, and, and, and like you say when Diddy said it in that documentary, we realized our worth. And not only is that created a new generation of younger artists that understand that from jump, now you have the artists beforehand saying, oh, now let's go back and get. Right. You know what what we can get that you know now we that we are icons but we're not the ones making the money off the iconic music there are, there are contracts that i get today that say that you know whatever i'm doing the company that i'm signing to deal with owns it for eternity basically whoever buys it from them if they if they die their family members get it you know they're thinking about the the wealth of their their family you know, with what, Multi-gener- what gener- multi generational wealth, legacy, multi generation, yes. Yep. And the reason why I got into this whole documentary thing was because I wanted to make it that I didn't want people to forget about our contribution to what we what we what we put what we lay down because they'll change the story. And you you know, a hundred years from now, nobody will know about a Ralph McDaniel. But we have to document it, and we have to make sure that everybody knows that this existed, not just for me my personal, you know, you know, uh, growth, but for my daughter and for her kids and for whoever else that comes, comes behind this and begin to create these things in, in across the country. Now you have street change, street change, street chain, uh, changes, you know, where they change the signs on the street. And that's important because it's documented in city information, government laws and things like that. This is notorious B I G way. This is Jam Master J Way. Um, this is Easy E Boulevard. Whatever it is, you know, those things are important because that's how you document these things in our history. And sometimes the community doesn't really see it like that. They love the music, but you know, it's like, well, what does that mean? That's what it means. It means a lot, not just for a hip hop artist's name to be up there, or it could be for a community leader's name to be up on that that street. You know, somebody that did so much for the community. And, and if you don't document it, people forget, you know, and it's, and I'm a historian, you know, I'm, I'm an archivist, I'm, you know, a content creator, you know, I'm, I'm all of those things that go like, wow, I didn't know this, you know, this existed, you know, this is proof of that, you know, we have to have receipts. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> listen, I only got you for a few more minutes and listen, let me just say right up front, thank you so much for taking time to to, to, to share and, and be on Beyond the Hype. But in the few minutes we have left, tell me what's next for you, what's next for the Video, video Music Box. Um, I don't even want to just call it a, a, a company, but the, the, the vision of Video Music Box. Um, and, and how Universe. can the Beyond the Hype audience kind of stay up to date about you know what's next? Um, because you're not done. I mean, that's it, the other cool thing about where you are. 
you can look back and see again you know what's been happening since you had this idea as a as an intern somewhere right. um but know that you're right this is an exciting time for all those things you laid out you know exciting time for content creation the metaverse is, is just being born i was just on a linkedin uh, web, uh seminar yesterday a live seminar where the, the the expert was like there's really no such thing as a metaverse yet not capital m there's all these smaller metaverse platforms that's evolving into a metaverse. Mm. So again, we're at the front end of what could be a bigger revolution than the internet was. Uh, yeah. But, but what's what's next? What do you see happening for you personally and for Video Music Box as you move forward and build on just an amazing legacy? I think the first thing is, you know, the Video Music Box collection, which is our nonprofit. If you have, if you're watching this, go visit it, uh, videomusicboxcollection.org. Um, we're a nonprofit. You can donate to it. We constantly digitizing, constantly digitizing. We personally have over 30,000 hours of content that we're wow. digitizing. Some things never seen before. Wow. You know, and not just all hip hop stuff. You know, some stuff is, you know, government stuff, you know, things that I just was like interested in 20, 30 years ago and like, let's cover this. You know, um, that is part of what I talked about when I said receipts. You know, these things actually existed because. You know, in New York City, Brooklyn doesn't look like it did 30 years ago. You got that right, man. Right. So if I tell somebody who lives, who just moved to Brooklyn, then they like, hey, man, this is what's happening right now. You do realize that where that was at, these are the things that were happening that, you know, that time. And in fact, I have it on videotape. I'll show it to you. So, <laughs> so all of these things, I think, are super important. I knew they were important when I first started doing it 30 years ago, but I didn't, you know, now I'm seeing it because I said it 30 years ago. Oh, you know what? At some point we're going to want to look at these and these things. And here we are today. And so we're getting that ready for this digital world because a lot of these things are on analog tapes, you know, these things are, you know, a, a, a document, a piece of paper or something, you know, we have to make this all available for this world that we're in now, this digital world, forget about, whatever the metaverse is going to be, but, you know, we have to be prepared that we have this ready. And, you know, um, so that's, that's my main priority right now. And I tell people, you know, they want me to get involved with their companies. And I say, if you're not supporting me in that way, you know, that's, it's not, might not work. I really need your help in this space, you know? Um, and so, and, you know, um, the music and the visuals still continue to do. We're on Instagram. We're on, all these different social medias and keeping active. I tell people the one thing that the the, uh, the pandemic did was it kept me active because I started to see people like D Nice and others, you know, like, you know, every day they were, they were going live on this thing called Instagram live. I didn't even know it existed until I saw it on there. Like, oh, you're actually live. Oh, okay. And so I watched D Nice from day one, who's a friend of mine. I know him for years. I remember He's, you know, he did, he's actually produced the music for self-destruction and, wow. um, you know, and he's a DJ and, you know, do all of this stuff and we hang out in clubs, you know, where there's 10 of us there, there's no more than that. And I watched it go from a hundred people one day to a thousand people to a hundred thousand people literally in four days. And I was like, I didn't even know that that many people, that that number could go that high. But that down your screen. Right. Right. And so I was like, what did I just watch? What just happened? But so that just shows me the power of this technology, the power of our soul, because he put his soul, he's a very passionate guy, um, loves music, loves technology, keeps up to date on what's happening. And, um, and so all of these, if you do a fraction of these things, not saying you have to do it like him, a fraction of it, you're in it. And, um, and, and that's what we continue to do. You know, we want to create more documentaries, more films, more things that show us in, in the real light. So, you know, because folks are getting older, we lost a lot of folks yeah. over the last three years, yeah. powerful, powerful people that so much information in their heads that, you know, we didn't get that, that from them. And so that, those stories are lost. That's it. You know, because that was the last person that knew, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I'm mindful of that all the time. I'm like, yo, sit down. I mean, not just with entertainers. I, you know, like I'll be like, yo, Ma, can you tell me about this? I'll speak to my, you know, speak to your family members, you know, get that story because 
you know, this is it. You know, you never know. You, you got that right. Listen, last thing. What would you say is the biggest lesson, I'll say lesson, when you look back over your journey over the last four decades since starting with your music box that you that you've taken from that? You know, again, you, you, you started this as a basically a kid with an idea that wouldn't go away. Um, and now you're 40 years later doing all these amazing things. What, what's, what's your big takeaway from your experience? Um, I say don't waste time mm. because you don't have time is nonstop. You know, not saying that I was wasting time, but I could have made better management of my time. But I didn't know that, you know, and I remember Quincy Jones told me, you know, he really didn't get his life together until he became like 45 years old. Hey, me too. My testimony. Yeah. <laughs> people, I didn't become a grown man until I was like in my mid 40s. Yeah. Um, well, man, I was an adult, but I wasn't really grown until my mid 40s. Yeah. And so, you know, suppose we had started when we were 30. Right. You know, I mean, you know, life is what it is. But if I could tell somebody, you know, and if you can and you can be focused and do whatever it is, just spend a little bit more time on, you know, on what's important. Or, or prioritize your life. Yeah. You know, Ralph, you've been very generous with your time. I salute you, everything that you've done and everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for being my guest on Beyond the Hype with Black Enterprise. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sir Alfred. Have a great day. You too, bro. All and right. This is Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior VP, Executive Editor at Large for Black Enterprise. You just listened to another great edition of Beyond the Hype. This episode is sponsored by JP Morgan Chase. Listen, I know you enjoyed this conversation. Come back next time. <laughs>